Hey, welcome to Speechless. We're glad to have you here. Uh, this very interesting day in the courts in Minnesota. You know, it's I guess when you have three acquaintances or friends that uh, are have trial at the same time, have some type of hearing before the courts, it's uh, it's kind of strange. Well, you know, you when you get on TV, you learn things, you learn people call and. You get to know people and uh, try to figure out. Well, we're going to cover these cases. We've got a lot of them to cover. Uh, one, uh, a ruling by the Minnesota Supreme Court on DUI, driving under the influence, what constitutes probable cause? Now, uh, so we talked about this aspect with Michelle McDonald's case of probable cause there. Well, the courts have even narrowed it further. Uh, of uh, to two, you only need two totality of circumstances to pull somebody over for DUI now. Uh, but the court made it look like there's four reasons. It's just unbelievable. Uh, also, I was in court, um, which is the main topics we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, listening to the Dolan case, they're the family that. Uh, had were the uh, San, uh, Samantha and Gia Rucky, the girls, ran to uh, to hide from their uh, father or to be protected from their father. Evidently, they weren't hiding. They just wanted protection. Uh, so they had a probable cause omnibus hearing today. So uh, we'll talk about that. Also, Dee Dee Evavold, uh, who is being accused of taking the girls there and being charged for deprivation of parental rights also um, had her case uh, for a, hey, give me my evidence type of case. So it was interesting. Uh, Dee Dee's not represented by an attorney, and the Dollins are, and you just kind of see the difference that takes place uh, in this. Also, uh, Jack Smith was being sued by the city of Grant, uh, for using the city logo in a um, campaign piece. And there was an omnibus hearing, not an omnibus, but there was a hearing before an administrative law judge hearing. And so we're going to talk about that. And then Diana Longry, uh, former mayor of Maplewood, was charged with stealing or removing public property from a courtroom and there was a hearing today on that to have the prosecutor uh, changed because of uh, political bias and political attack against Diana Longry uh, and a number of reasons we'll get into that but there was a hearing but a surprise happened so that hearing didn't take place and we're going to tell you about that surprise. So first of all I want to deal with this uh, um, DUI case. So we're going to get ready for graphic number nine, uh, slide number nine. We don't want to put it up right away. But here was a man who was uh, pulled over for DWI. And what he did is he took a right hand turn coming out of uh, a building, or not coming out of a building, down the street. The turn on the street was about a 100 to 120 degree turn, right hand turn. You know, so it, those are difficult enough to make uh, being sober. I suppose they'd be harder being drunk. Uh, but there's actually a law out there on the law of right hand turns. And that law says you must, as far as practicable, um, I think that's not the right terminology, but you got to, you got to be close. Uh, so you can't veer, you got to do that turn right uh, as, as far as practicable. And so what does that mean? And so that was part of the challenge. <laughs> what does that mean? You know, that's kind of vague. Um, so if you go over an unmarked road, if you go across the middle of an unmarked road a little bit, which what it turned out to be, uh, is, is that too much? And then another issue came up was whether uh, he was 
um, weaving in the lane. Now they've come up with a new standard, the Supreme Court, what defines weaving in the lane? And all you need is one weave now. So weaving in the lane means you're in the lane, let's say you're in the middle of the lane, and you just drift to the left, but don't cross the center line, but you kind of drift over, that's weaving in the lane. And it only needs to be once, but adding a turn where you're a little bit too wide and later down the road you weave once, because that's all it was, that's all they're accusing of, that was enough to pull them for a stop for drunk driving. Um, so, <laughs> uh, well, and, and the comments that are coming back to me are, well, that's just going to enable charging virtually any driver on the road at will. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's going to do that. And so, I mean, I know I ride around with a lot of people and every single one of them, every time they're out to drive, could be get pulled over. Anybody for any reason now. If you go, if you just deviate from the middle a little bit, you just kind of, you know, weave over. If you turn down to, you know, turn your radio off, you just go a little bit from the middle to the edge, but you don't cross the line, but you get real close. You've weaved, you can get pulled over. So they talked about the totality. So let's get that graphic up now. And, and here's what constitutes um, a probable cause. Okay, not close as practicable to the right-hand curb or edge of the roadway. Okay, so if you didn't do a good job, you messed up a little bit, you could have been close as practicable. And that was the challenge is what does that mean? Okay, and so when the charges came in on this guy for as close as practicable, the uh, charge was, hey, that's too vague, or the, cha the challenge was constitutional challenge, that's too vague. It needs to be uh, more than more defined than that because otherwise you know you're pulling anybody over on any turn you know unless you nail it so uh, you can bring it back to me now for a while the I mean can, can you do that now the the issue as far as the court goes for practicable uh, is oh you know what you didn't bring this up during the trial time Okay, so we're, we're, we're throwing that issue out, we're not, we're not dealing with it. But they go to a long discussion through it and then say, we can't deal with it. That was my understanding of what I was reading here. <laughs> but the judge said the video showed that the police officer's description and testimony wasn't even close to what had taken place. And that uh, the district court judge found that all four of these elements that we, we will go through again were enough. Well, let's go to the second one. The, the squad car video showed Morse's vehicle drifting in its lane. And in the testimony on record, it was only once. One drift. Whew. Okay. Uh, let's go back to the graphic there. The fact that the events occurred close to 2 a.m. bar closing time was another factor in this. And the fact that Morse was leaving downtown an area with bars. Now, you know, you, I mean, I've been pulled over at night for, uh, uh, I had a headlight out. But this officer grilled me because I was at a meeting that lasted till like 1 in the morning. It's on a Saturday. And uh, it, it would have been a Saturday, Friday night. It was on a Saturday morning. And um, the officer pulled me over, said a tail light was out, you know. But he grilled me over and over. What are you doing out this late at night? <laughs> I mean... Well, I, I would have known how to better answer that then, but I was kind of going, why are you asking? What, is that, what does that matter? We're a free country. We can be out at night. We've got these roads. We can be out 
all hours. Um, so anyway, circumstantial evidence is now sufficient to charge. Uh, <clears throat> so bottom line, if you're out at 2 o'clock at night, you're leaving the downtown area, bars are closing, or you're anywhere near a bar, which is like everywhere, um, that's, that's sufficient, and you just weave once, and you make a wider turn than you need to. I, I mean, it's the police state uh, that's coming on, that's going on here. So, uh, the, the case is A14-1202, uh, State of Minnesota versus Tyler Thomas DeVries Morse. Okay. Um, you know what? Be safe driving anyway. That's what I would say. Okay. Uh, let's see. I think we're getting it. Did we get a call? Come in. We got a caller. All right. Caller, uh, you got a comment or question? I can't hear you yet. We're uh, pulling the sound up. Yes, I just heard your... Uh, All right. Thank you. you. Yes, I just heard your comment on this recent court case. Yeah. But my impression is that, let's say you are stopped, uh, you still have a right to say yes or no unless you are arrested uh, if they want to search your car. That's my understanding. Uh, to say yes or no on searching your car? You're yes. correct. So that, that was not an issue at all? That was not part of this case, no. That's all I wanted uh, to ask the question on. Yeah, okay. Thanks, Caller. Thank you. Bye. So, yeah, I mean, y y they still have to come up with something else to search the car, but to pull them over for suspicion of DWI with those things, I, I think that's a big stretch, a big reach. All right, I was in Dakota County Courthouse and something really strange was going on. Um, it, it was sad. Either way around it, no matter what happened, it was sad. There's a young man, uh, I don't know, could have been 18 to uh, 30. I would say he was more 18 to 25, but I really don't know his name, his name was, or his age. His name was Sammy Jackson. I have to uh, do some re research on this, but he was being charged with sexual assault. He was facing 306 to um, 360 days, uh, year, uh, months in jail. So that's 25 to 30 years. And he was there to do a plea, okay? And in that plea, uh, he comes out, he's in his gear, and the whole thing was set up to do a plea, and he just breaks down. He says, I can't do this. I can't plead guilty. Uh, he's saying stuff like, um, uh, you know, well, he just breaks down crying. And when he was asked, are you going to plead, he goes, no. Uh, yeah? Lauren's on the phone. Okay. Do you want him now? No, make, I'll, I'll, make him wait, yeah. I'll finish the story. Okay, okay. and... Uh, You know, so the judge removes him uh, from from the courtroom, and this is Judge Karen Aspaugh handling all these cases. And I tell you, I really like her court demeanor. I do. Other people don't. I she lets people talk. Okay, she lets them get their say. Uh, most judges wouldn't do that. But what I found with her letting people get their say, the court moves along faster things get done and people feel like they've been heard okay whether they have been heard <laughs> whether she understands what they're saying is another issue and whether she follows through with what she says she's going to do is a whole nother issue but her demeanor in court is, is really good uh, she's the only one that I see that I've been in front of that has really good demeanor um, and I haven't been in front of everybody so she then talks to the crowd there, okay? You know, you got a mom and probably a sister there, 
She's talking to them, saying, hey, this is an emotional time. I get that. I get how emotional that is. Uh, and you have victims over here and victims' families. I get how emotional that is. And I need your help. And I need you not to say anything, not to cry, not to respond. Uh, yes, it's a tough deal. And she talked to everybody for about five minutes. Uh, sometimes, you know, talks down to people. But she wasn't trying to talk down, and you can tell that. So eventually they bring the, the guy back out, uh, uh, Sammy Jackson, and at, you know the deal was to plead. And, and, he, and he's talking to his attorney, and he says, I, I didn't do this. I can't, I can't plead. But it looked like his public defender attorney was trying to make him plead. Okay, So what he was going to get in the plea was 20 years. Okay, and that's, um, that's a long time. Uh, what type of sexual assault? I don't know. Uh, what took place? Uh, how egregious it was? But then the judge, Karen Aspaugh, went and said, hey, look, you know, here's your three options. Explained them very well. Plead not guilty. You, uh, you plead uh, guilty with, uh, and then plead your case to have a lower sentence, or you plead guilty based on what the agreement is with the prosecutor, and uh, I will take the prosecutor's, uh, you, the agreement you worked out with the prosecutor and the uh, public defender. And of course the whole thing was for him to plead guilty, and he couldn't do it. Uh, and so he has to come back Monday morning uh, and may then make a deal whether he's going to trial or not. You know, and if he's saying he didn't do it, I tell you what, you better go to trial, you know, because it really isn't going to be any worse uh, going to trial if you think, think you're innocent. Uh, you better give your shot at it because if you don't, um, you, you got a bad situation anyway. Okay. Well, another court case, City of Grant, took place. Uh, Jack Smith was being charged with using a city logo. And we got one of our reporters uh, on the line, uh, Lauren Cedarstrom from the All Around Grant Show, who was at the hearing, uh, administrative law, judge, law hearing. So, Lauren, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can oh, you hear me? I can hear you. So Okay. Can I, I'll start with the background, if I can. Yes, please. Uh, there was a charter in Grant that the, uh, the mayor put forth and got a charter going, a charter commission. And a ch charter is a constitution above a city that gives it rules and regulations. Well, then the mayor, when he couldn't stack the charter commission with his cronies, he got upset and wouldn't allow the uh, charter commission to meet in the city offices, so they had to meet right. in Montemedi. Right. Okay, so they, they pr proceeded through this and had a special election on 1013 of last year. Uh huh. And a special election. Well, you know, those special elections, people aren't usually aware of them, especially for a local uh, municipality, a small place like Grant, with right. 4,000 people. Right. And it's rural. Right. So, what, what uh, a bunch of people did that were involved with that sent out literature and mailers. Okay. And one of the things they had was they used, there's a city logo. It's not a seal, it's a logo. Okay. And uh, so, they put that on there when they put the mailer out. All right. Now, uh, uh, a person came forward by the name of Ellen Gillespie. She made a complaint. She's an attorney who lives down in Indian Hills. And she didn't think it, she didn't, was upset that somebody used the logo. Okay that it was like the city was sending it, and she knew they didn't, it wasn't the city that sent it, so okay. she made the complaint. All right. Now, the, the complaint policy we have in Grant, and I, when I was in the planning commission, I helped develop that, what, with, when there's a formal written complaint, staff has to, is supposed to make a, the first contact, a phone call, to try to resolve it, and then it goes to the attorney. Okay? okay. In this case, that did not happen. There was no phone call. It went directly to the attorney. Okay. And the timing is of the essence, and I'll come back, I'll tie that back in a little bit later. All right. Uh, so, 
Uh, other people that send literature, mailbox, you know, paper box drops off using the the city logo, but Jack Smith was the only one that was charged. And so was the, there charged. was a number of other people that were using mailings with the, the city logo? Yes. Okay. How was and, the city logo used? Was it well, as just, um, this is about the city of Grant? Yes, it's, it's about kind the of, city of Grant, okay? That, that's what it was about. In, in the complaint, they charged him with using the seal. Now, the city seal is not the same as a logo. Okay. City seal is that thing that makes the impression on a on the on legal document that has right. to be filed with the county. Does it look the same as the uh, logo? Not, not at all. You can't even see it because it creates an impression on the paper, and then, okay. the, then the clerk signs it. Okay. So that's an official document, whereas it, the, the logo is a little picture like a trademark to... to to visually identify an idea. Right, okay. And like post or a little round cir circle or General Mills, sure, GM, you know, right. type of thing. Well, the, okay, that was the complaint. Then uh, the first person they had up for, for a, a Well, what, uh, Lauren, uh, what were they charging Jack Smith with? What was they the charge? They were charging him with using the city seal. And what, uh, and what statute? Is that a crime or a? Uh, I think it was two ten dash eleven B. Okay. And that this was, by the way, in front of Office of Administrative Hearing. All there right. was a th panel of three judges that hears campaign practices complaints. All right. It was Lipman, O'Reilly, and Lefebvre. Okay. And uh, but there was quite a bit of discussion because. Discovery was limited, as was the data practices. They were the city was less than cooperative. Okay, oh. giving the information they had a difficult time. But in the charges, they said it was the city seal. Well, in fact, it was not. Okay, and the, we spent about a, an hour on that, determining that it was the city logo. And the city has two logos: one that goes out. There are two circles: one that goes out that says "City News," and another one that says "The City of Grant, a home in the country." Okay. And both of those were used, and that was... But the interesting thing about this is uh, going back to the origination of the symbols. <clears throat> in 1998, uh, Rick Van Zewal, there was a contest, and he came up with, the, drew the logo, a home in the city, you uh -huh. know, or home in the country, I mean. Right. Well, he got a $25 prize. Unanimously, they adopted that logo. But the difference is, for example, Van Zewal did not assign his rights to the city. If, if for example, you design a button for the Winter Carnival, how right. do the contest requirements are that if you win, you have to give the Winter Carnival the exclusive rights to your symbol? All right, okay. Uh, Van Zewal did not do that, so it, the city well, never... Well, but the city didn't ask for that either. Is that what I hear right. you saying? The city didn't say, if you win... Mm -hmm. We get the logo and get to use it. You get exclusively. The, exclusively, they didn't do that. Nope. Did the no. city file any type of uh, patent or uh, trademark copyright? Nope, not copyright? At all. Nope. Nothing on the logo. Yep. The only thing that the court, court law that I understand, a case of law, is if you consistently use the logo, someone else cannot can patent or and or copyright that if it's been in use by another party. Okay. They, they can use it, for example, they could take that logo and put it on a T-shirt and sell T-shirts with that Grand City logo, and that's not illegal because okay. it becomes generic, kind of like a Kleenex, you know, it became generic. Okay. So, All right. <clears throat> so anyway, the first person they have up for witness is Bob Tufty. Okay. What was really ironic about that is a couple of years ago, he took a petition around, and he was brought before the Office of Administrative Hearing for lying on a petition drive, okay? Uh -huh. And the reason he got off the hook was, in September for that, a couple of months before, the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals said that was it was all right to lie on ballot questions because okay. it was freedom of speech. Sure. I don't know if you remember that. Right. Okay, so he floundered. So he's been an adjudicated liar, okay? So then the, the, the a Dick Dada who... Are you there? I think we lost him. Okay, we'll have to call, call him back, or uh, we'll have to. He'll have to call back. Um, well, that's interesting. So, what I understand is Bob Tufty then did not. He acknowledged that the 
symbol, uh, the logo was not, uh, he realized when he got the material it was not from the city of Grant. There's a whole bunch of other information on there that would sh show that it's not from the city of Grant and that it was campaign information. Uh, so that's, that's really interesting. Um, so also the city did not file the um, logo with the Secretary of State. It's interesting, if Lauren gets back on, I want to talk about the discovery and what kind of problems they had with discovery because that just seems to be the, the trend by prosecutors or people uh, throwing accusations out of people that, that they're not getting the information uh, that, the, that they need to get. Uh, so if Lauren comes back, we'll talk about that. But in the meantime, qu quickly, we'll talk about former Mayor Diana Longry of Maplewood um, and her case today. She was being charged with something to the effect that she took public property uh, from the city council meeting room. Uh, and the, the prosecutors in this case are uh, Kelly and Lemon Law Firm. Okay, well, I, and I don't know if Lemon's the last name of the law firm anymore, but Kelly was. Uh, and and it, just just tell, okay, we got Lauren back on, but just tell him to, to wait a second. I'm going to finish this story. We'll get back to him. Uh, what, what Kelly ha had been the prosecuting and civil attorney for Maplewood, a big contract, somewhere around three hundred thousand, you know, give or take a hundred thousand. Still a big contract for the year, and he uh, resigned, huh? Back. Yeah, he resigned after uh, an, um, it was exposed that he was giving out um, private information, the city of Maplewood's attorney-client privilege, and he was leaking it to the press. So he got caught, he resigned, and now uh, a different law firm came in to handle Maplewood's uh, information. Well, what happened is that, you know, a couple mayors later, they bring back Kelly and I think Lemon, I'm not positive, law firm. Now his son is the prosecutor. And so the, this is really more of a, a scene so the hearing today was to get rid of this prosecution, have another city prosecute because of the history between the Kelly law firm and um, Diana Longry. That was going to be the motion, but and, and should be a different. I mean, there's so much bias there against Diana uh, with this law firm. They should have passed it on to another count, another city uh, with a different prosecutor. Probably wouldn't even prosecute. And that's why they don't want to do that. So you go before the judge today, and what I was retold by my reporters was that uh, the judge ended up recusing herself, Elena Osby. I don't know why yet, uh, and maybe I, I'm sure the judge has to make some kind of findings. Maybe the judge was on Diana Long we show at some time. But why did the judge wait until now to recuse themselves? Why didn't they do that? at the beginning okay uh, and now they got to go back for another hearing uh, maybe the judge maybe from the prior hearing Elena Osby wasn't on that hearing and you know who knows but so the judge recused themselves for just being potentially on the show on Dinah Longry's show local cable on this channel Okay, and yet the Kelly and Law Firm has gone and um, has some beef with Diana Longry. Uh, Diana exposed the misdeeds of uh, the senior partner of the Kelly and Lemon Law Firm, and now his son's running it. Why don't they recuse themselves? That's really interesting. Okay, Lauren Cedarstrom, are you uh, back there? I'm there. Okay. So, Where did I leave off? Did I get through Bob Tufty when I quit, when my phone died? Uh, <laughs> your phone died. Oh, no. Uh, 
Yes, you got through Bob Tufty, uh, but I had a question on Bob. Um, he, you, you talked about him lying. Uh, what did he say about when he saw the logo on the literature? Well, he complained about it, thought it was unfair. But looking at it, he, he knew that it wasn't set out by the city, but he was upset by it anyway. Okay. He knew it wasn't set out by the city. Did anybody, any testifier, say they thought it was sent out by the city? Nope. Tina Logan was the next one. Okay. She floundered. She didn't think the city set it out, but she saw the logo, and she was also against the charter. Uh, and then we, so that's two of them. And number three was Kim Points, our city clerk. Well, she was a, a, a promoted to put an uh, administrator by her name, but she didn't say that when she testified, which was kind of interesting. She said she didn't use the seal on anything, but Donahue pulled up some evidence and proved that, in fact, because you, it's very difficult to see just the imprint. So when you photocopy it, you can't determine that it's a seal. You know what I'm saying? So she said she never used the seal, but you had evidence that she did. Yep. Wow. You, the other you, th go ahead. Oh, no, you go ahead. The other thing is, she said they put a disclaimer about using that logo on the website. Okay. But she said before the election, but when Dick Donahue and Jack Smith went in there, she showed him the email that it was November 4th when they put it on, which is obviously after the October 13th election. Okay. But by that time, she had gone home and couldn't be cross-examined. Okay. Oh, oh. well, why wasn't she cross-examined earlier? She was, but uh, Dick hadn't produced that yet because there was there were just pages and pages of evidence. It was just unbelievable. Okay, um, when you talked about not getting discovery or having trouble getting discovery, what was going on there? Well, first of all, Nick Vivian said it was privileged information. They wouldn't give her give him some of the information. What they was denied. privileged? Well, like the bill and any correspondence between Nick Vivian and the city clerk. And they also said uh, during discovery, uh, I mean, sorry, during the data practices, they refused to also give them some information. So that was very interesting. Um, so the attorney, uh, did he raise the issue as a reason to dismiss the case or? Well, he asked to have it dismissed earlier. And that, and that wasn't done. But uh, that was on, I didn't read any discovery issues in that dismissal. No, the, Or in that uh, motion to dismiss. No, but what, he, the, what they did do is they dismissed Jack Smith's wife because she didn't participate in anything, though she lived, they, you see, they used his address for their PAC, their political action right. committee. And it was a loose organization, it wasn't formal. But other people also used that same address when they sent things out, even though Jack was not involved sending them out. So the state has to prove then that Jack actually sent the letter out. Right. Or the and information they, they had out. several mailbox stuffers where they put in the paper boxes. Uh -huh. they, had, they had several of those that, that he did not have a hand in. There were other ones that did not have a hand in that. Okay. And, uh, so that, that was pointed out. Uh-huh. And uh, let's see, uh, there was, uh, again, there was no, no phone call to, 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 to discover this or to go through, through the complaint policy. They just went to letter an attorney. Okay, Jack had registered as a PAC with his address, but again, it was a non-structured and everybody used that. Uh, I guess they said there was a problem with discovery and data practices. They kept citing client privilege, and I've done data practices at, for my case, at, uh, and they do not provide you with the information they're supposed to. Okay. They, they did go back and find, the only thing she could find was that 1998 Bands of Wall uh, logo thing. Uh, yeah. Other handouts had been used, that logo, but only Jack was, was prosecuted. Okay. And they sent the letter on the 7th. They sent, the, the attorney sent the letter on the 7th, but the mailing went out on the 2nd to the printer, and then they went out every door direct where the printer directly takes it to the Egan Post Office. All right. The Egan Post Office parcels it out to the different post offices. So, so the, the notice, major, the notice wasn't given before the thing had already been sent out. That's right. 
It okay. already been it already went to the printer before you got the letter. Well, it seems to me that based on the statute 21011B, you know that that uh, that they would have had um, that the the city didn't meet the requirements of proving that this was their logo. They had only rights to the logo. Nobody else could use it, and um, they didn't prove that Jack actually used it. Did Jack say he used it? Was he yes. asked? Yes, he did. He did oh, say he did use it. And they asked him at the end, why did you use the logo okay. from the newsletter that went out? He said, because it said news in there, and it was an off-year election, and they had to make people aware that at this odd time, this October 13th, they okay. wanted to get people to be aware that there was an election because okay. many times off your elections, there's little or no participation. Right. And so Jack did admit to sending it out. Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. So then it's the whole thing is whether he got to use the logo or not. That's right. All right. Thanks for the call. I appreciate it. we got to move on. Uh, so, I mean, it just looks like whether he can use it or not, you know, and whether the, the law allows him to or where the city did enough to protect their uh, logo, and it doesn't sound like it, but who knows? We'll see what gets decided. Okay, the big case, the Dolan case, uh, the, the family that had the ranch where the two girls ran away to uh, and were taken to to be protected from their father, who the children thought were going to kill them, uh, at least these two daughters, so there was a hearing today, and it was very, very fascinating on the issues being raised. So, you know, we're talking about disclosure and how hard it is to get disclosure from those that are pro uh, prosecuting you, or sometimes people say persecuting you. Um, they requested a joint hearing for the husband and wife. They're separate charges, separate people, but, and you can have separate hearings. Those are your rights but they wanted a joint hearing, so they're each husband and wife, the Dolans, had, um, this Gina and Douglas Dolan had their own attorneys there, but they were working together. So one of the motions, uh, first motion, was the motions to compel disclosure. Uh, and because the, the state was not giving certain information, and uh, so there was also a motion to dismiss. And so they were asking for specific records and they're asking for any exculpatory evidence. What in the CHIPS record in family court, there, there's a CHIPS record, there's a CHIPS case going on, and they want that information. What were the girls saying? What, did, did people have reason to believe that the girls were in harm? Because that's an affirmative defense, okay? But the state, and it seems to me like Judge Karen Asbaugh really doesn't want to give that information out because there's minors involved. Well, look, you're, you're about ready to get um, creamed, you know, or facing prison time, and you can have evidence that verifies what you were told. And in, that, in those CHIPS hearings, the records are sealed, okay? You don't get to hear what the kids say. And so you don't get your defense. What if the kids were saying was uh, verifying what they had told you, and that's consistent. So you have a defense. The kid's saying, hey, you know, this is what my dad did. This is what he did to us. And, and so we are protecting them. Now, uh, Mrs. Dolan uh, had, has had extensive training in sexual abuse, spotting sexual abuse in children, uh, and and knowing how to deal with that. Um, so, and, and they're actually telling the county, hey, you got an intent to conceal here. You, you're, you're concealing, oh no, they talked about intent to conceal. Okay, so there was not only the chip protection, there was, a con there was the conversations that the children had with Judge David Knudsen, uh, who that was private, and nobody gets to see that. But there the kids are saying, hey, we told the judge this is what our dad was doing. Whether it's true or not is a whole other issue. But this is what they were telling the judge, and this is what they were telling other people. But we don't know what they told the judge. 
So let's see what was the kids were saying. Uh, let's go and then, then there's this uh, Gilbertson, a counselor who diagnosed the children uh, with uh, parental uh, alienation uh, being provided to them where one parent, uh, specifically Sam Grazini Rucky, was trying to alienate the kids from their father and that was his conclusion but the he talked to the girls and talked to the kids but what was said what were the kids saying and then right after the kids were found they went into foster care for 11 days well what did this kid say in those 11 days okay and and the state is not releasing that information because they say it's irrelevant okay it's all about your mind set before these things happen. Well, wait a second, if Gilbertson and the judge, uh, why wouldn't the 11 days, wouldn't that, uh, why wouldn't the foster home, wouldn't that verify, uh, could, it could verify what the kids were saying. And so that parents had a reasonable, or anybody had a reasonable expectation to protect the kids. Okay, so one inch, another interesting, um, thing that came up was there is a concealment. They're being charged with deprivation of parental rights, concealing the kids. That means hiding them. And they wanted that charge thrown out because they weren't concealing them according to their, their mind. They were saying, hey, uh, they're in plain view. Uh, over 30 people gave record, testified wrote affidavit saying, we knew the girls were here, we knew their name, they're out in public, they were being homeschooled, uh, but they got haircuts, went out to eat, it, they had access to phones, they had their own phones, they had, um, that was my understanding, they also had cars that they can use, and they were told over and over again, we're not going to lie to you, we're not going to lie about you, you know, if you want to go, you need to get out of here. We understand your safety, but when you want to leave, go. Okay? And we'd like you to go. And the girls are going, no, we're safe here. And so in the issue of the homeschool uh, that came up was that the Dolans, the only issue on concealing that I understood was that the Dolans didn't register these kids for homeschool which is a requirement by the state. And the defense really didn't answer that. I talked to them afterwards and they kind of said, well, the Amish don't have to um, register their kids in homeschooling because of religious grounds. And that comes up into the other issue is that they made a motion that they did not have to, uh, th they said, we have our religious uh, perspective. We did this out of respect for our religion, and we have freedom of religion. And they talked about in the Minnesota Constitution, and if I can find my, uh, let's go to slide number eight. Okay, slide number eight there, we'll bring that up. And this is what they claimed as their defense. Oh boy, I can't read that from here. I'll read it from mine. Where, now, where did I put that? Let's see here. Whoa, everything just disappeared. No, there it is. Okay, here's what it says. Freedom of conscience, no preference to be given to any religious establishment or mode of worship. Uh, the enumeration of rights in this Constitution shall not deny or impair others retained by and inherent in the people the right of every man to worship God according to the dictates of his own conscience shall never be infringed, nor shall any man be compelled to attend, erect, or support any place of worship or to maintain any religious or ecclesiastical ministry against his consent, nor shall any control of or interference with the rights of conscience be permitted or any preference be given by law to any religious establishment or mode of worship. 
but the liberty of conscience hereby secured shall not be so construed as to excuse acts of licentiousness or justify practices inconsistent with the peace or safety of the state, nor shall any money be drawn from the treasury for the benefit of any religious society or religious or theological seminaries. So what they were arguing, they had religious freedoms. They believed these kids were being abused, okay? And they actually used Acts, uh, 20, uh, Acts 521, which uh, uh, Apostle Paul says, um, we must obey God rather than man. And in this situation of protecting the kids, so they they were using religious freedom um, and freedom of conscience to protect these kids as grounds for uh, dismissing this case. Uh, but they were also using the aspect. So so there was a conflict coming in where the judge was saying, well, that's part of an affirmative defense. So how how does this affirmative defense affect probable cause? You know, that they, they shouldn't be, you know, the state saying is they have probable cause that uh, you took the kids. Um, of course, they found the kids there or that you were depriving a parent. And, and the uh, Dollinger saying based on the totality of the evidence uh, that is out there, they lack probable cause because the affirmative defense is you had a reasonable belief that the children were in harm. And that's according to our statutes. So let's go to uh, graph uh, number 15. Um, when you're being charged with deprivation of parental rights, you can, you, you can deprive a parent of their rights. And in, in, this is what it, the situation where and you can deprive them. It is an affirmative defense if a person charged under subdivision one proves that the person reasonably believed the action taken was necessary to protect the child from physical or sexual assault or substantial emotional harm. And of course that's what the children were claiming, the girls were claiming the whole time. And you had a reason to believe uh, that. So you know, whether one of the charges of concealment will be dropped, who knows uh, what will happen there. Uh, it, it is a fascinating case. You have the, uh, um, let's see what some other issues. Uh, so, you know, with, with these kids uh, giving testimony and minors, what, what is going to happen now, and my understanding from what I can tell, this is an agreement, but I think it's a contested agreement, that the judge at least goes and look at the records for these areas of the interview with Judge, uh, the Counselor Gilbertson, the interview with the Judge David Knudsen, the, the home, uh, the foster home, and then the reunification council, uh, place that was after the foster home. What were the girls saying there? You know, what were they saying? So um, if they get that information, well, the judge is going to review that to see if that then can be uh, brought out in the case. Well, as a defense, well, here, here's the interesting thing. Uh, you're, you're just relying on the judge. Okay, on that information, does the jury get to hear it as a defense? Does the jury get to hear what the kid said if this goes to trial? And in either way, on either side, what if the judge says, you know what, the girl said the same thing that the Dollins are saying took place and, and it's all consistent, so there was reasonable, the case is dismissed. Well, the other side should be saying, hey, wait a second, we didn't get to hear, we didn't get to see what they were saying. How do we know that they really said that? That's what I don't like about a lot about juvenile cases, because they don't become public. And, and I don't think these cases cause as much harm, the trials cause harm, as much harm to the kids as the actual events going on around, uh, you know, the divorce, the... Um, running away and so 
that was another reason for the dismissal, saying, hey, th these were runaways. These weren't, these weren't uh, kids that were abducted and taken. These girls ran away on their own. And the judge even brought up, I thought was an interesting question, and I don't know why she brought it up, uh, because the prosecutor didn't offer it, and neither did the defense say you could have done something else. But the, pro the judge said, well, why, why, don't you, uh, why don't you charge with harboring a runaway uh, under the dep deprivation st standard? And the state said, hey, because we don't believe they ran away. You know, we, we're not charging them that. We don't, we don't think they left on their own. We think they were told to this that they didn't run away and that the psychological pressure put on them uh, by the mother and other people uh, that they were uh, basically brainwashed in, into leaving. Um, so, but why did the judge bring that up? You know, it, was that in her purview to do that? And so the judge was kind of doing a lot of bidding for the, the prosecuting. Uh, then the judge also talked about, well, what about hiding in plain sight? So remember, so here the girls are out, out in plain view in front of everybody, uh, but they're so far away that, no, you know, the, the people closer to the situation wouldn't know where they're at. So why not charge under that? The, the prosecution didn't do that. Um, and then the defense brought up, well, then you got the, the SMART case, the national attention of the SMART case where this child was living, you know, within blocks from her home, but she was concealed. Um, and this goes all around the concealment question, where, and they're saying she was concealed, but she was only blocks away. So, you know, what is it? You know? So obviously wasn't hiding in plain sight because she was hidden, concealed, where these girls were out in the open, but they didn't want to go home. And the only way they went home was because the police came and took them. And when the police showed up and, and said, hey, you know, we got a warrant for the rest uh, to search this place, and they asked where the girls were, and they said, oh, in the back here you know, in the barn or whatever, you know, and the police were shocked. Um, you know, interesting case to say the least, and so we'll, we will hear uh, the results, um, you know, how long there's a trial coming up uh, in September, I believe, on this case. No, July, in July, so we're going to hear from the judge fairly soon. The prosecutor did not have the exhibits to the uh, defense counsel ready uh, until today. They got the evidence today and the prosecutor also didn't have a rebuttal to the constitutional challenge written but now you know it's got till May 23rd to get the rebuttal in. So it was, it was fascinating and I tell you anytime you can get a chance or learn about these cases you need to go to the courtroom and hear what's going on and learn a little bit about what's going on. Uh, so let's look at uh, then the last person who was accused of taking the girls up there, again, deprivation of parental rights, Dee Dee Evervold. Uh, she doesn't have rep uh, representation. And she wasn't, the, the state, she, or she wasn't uh, getting information from the state, and the state was actually saying, you got to pay for this information. Okay, we don't, we're, we're charging you with a crime, and we got evidence against you, but you got to pay to receive the evidence. Well, according to the rules, uh, that's what it says. You got to pay for the evidence. Now, according to the Minnesota Constitution, uh, on redress of wrongs, um, Every person is entitled to a certain remedy in the laws for all injuries or wrongs which he may receive to his person, property, or character. A false accusation would be one of those, too. Um, 
and to obtain justice freely and without purchase, completely and without denial, promptly and without delay, conformable to the laws. And so what does freely mean? You know, you're being charged and you got to pay for getting the evidence that's there against you. And that's in the rules. There's no state law that you have to pay. It's in the court rules. At least Dee Dee hasn't been told of any. So she says, where's my evidence? They're asking me to pay. And the judge said, well, you either got to be informed of papyrus uh, or uh, that was basically it. Oh, you got to come down. You can come down and look at your evidence and read through it uh, and not have to pay for that. And you can make your own copies and stuff like that. But other than that, you got to pay unless you're informed of papyrus. All right. Well, my advice to Didi, I'd get an attorney <laughs> because uh, they were set for trial. And I think what Didi wanted was an on omnibus hearing and motions to dismiss and all that. And those weren't presented uh, right, right there and then either. So we'll see what happens. It's a tough, tough business, tough, tough world. And uh, hopefully reconciliation and forgiveness and putting things, pieces back together can take place. Uh, it, we'll see what happens. All right, remember, if you don't stand up for other people's liberties, who's going to stand up for yours? And good men don't do nothing. God bless. Have a great week. Right.